Hello. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be back at the Polyglot Gathering and thank you to the organizers for putting on such a wonderful show. It's always a pleasure to take part in this event. I love it every year and I look forward to it every year. Today, I wanted to talk about something that has been a question that I get asked or is a comment that I get about how long it seems to take for certain people to learn languages. And I think that there's a lot of information out there on the internet where people seemingly learn languages very quickly. And sometimes I speak to people and they say, well, why doesn't it take me uh, that short a time to learn a language? And it seems like a very basic question, but I think it's a very important one to discuss. And what I'd like to do today is take you on a bit of a journey to explore that and to talk about my own experience. So how long does it take to learn a language? Well, I had somebody come to me a few weeks ago saying, you know, they felt really depressed and disappointed that they hadn't made the progress they thought they would make within months of learning a language only. And I was really surprised. Well, you've only been doing it for like six months or something. It's not a particularly long uh, period of time. And uh, I was a bit confused. They said, well, they looked at other people who seemed to be winning all the time. They were getting their goals, meeting their goals. They were speaking the language. They were creating videos. They were answering questions. They were doing all these things that seemed to be the things that they weren't doing, maybe. Well, they didn't really know because it seemed almost like a dark arts. Um, people were apparently speaking languages in a very short amount of time. And I was trying to get over this feeling of them feeling like they were a loser and you know why couldn't they win like the other people and and we we talked about it and you know sometimes I think with languages it can feel like we're, we're on you know the road where there is mist and fog and we don't see the road clearly so it feels like we're going on in the fog forever and ever and ever whereas it feels like other people are just sort of on this straight road and it's very clear and it's all very calm and it's all very easy and very uneventful and almost it just happens. And of course, I know that's not really the case. So I wanted to explain German and my life and how that's been. So many, many years ago, I released some videos on YouTube and I, the very first one I released was about me speaking 16 of the languages I'd studied at that point. And then not long after, I released a, a video as well where I was speaking German. And I explained that I studied German in a very intensive way in Germany. And I had to speak German uh, to go and sit an exam to uh, be able to study German and uh, having not ever studied it before. And I did that by going to Germany and within a three month period. And of course, we all know the language in three months idea um you know benny talked about that a lot that's his brand and and so that's one of the sticking points really when we get to this question of how long does it take and the idea of putting months onto it or weeks or days or years or whatever it is this idea and i felt maybe i was contributing to that of you know i learned german in three months well did i really learn german in three months is the question and this is where I find using the term of three months or how measuring time in that way quite challenging and difficult and also maybe a bit misleading. So the person I was talking to had been doing their language for, as they said, months and months and months. And there was me releasing a video, speaking German and saying, I learned German in three months. And of course, it's kind of true. I went to Germany and I spent three months and I hadn't studied German before. But the perception of me being this person that, that spoke German in the video after just three months of German is a perception. It's not the reality of my story with German. In fact, far from it. Um, you know, that video wasn't made straight after I came back from Germany. Uh, that video was made later. Uh, so that's one aspect where that doesn't really fit. The other thing is that before I went to Germany, I came from a country where we speak a Germanic language. This is my 
home city of Chester. And in Chester, we speak English and Welsh. And the English that I spoke as a child growing up, and also uh, the types of dialects that I had uh, spoken around me of English, meant that I was actually quite aware of a lot of Germanic vocabulary. So I had a basis in Germanic languages before I even started to go to German. I already knew the word hand, I already knew the word arm, I already knew the word finger, fingernail, fingernagel, it's not so far away, shoulder, shoulder, you know, you have lots of those kinds of things, swim, swam, swum, drink, drank, drunk, they're all very similar. You can get a lot of help with learning German just by knowing English. Even the strange numbering system, we have a song in English, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. And of course, four and twenty, vier und zwanzig, we know, go together, and that's how we used to count in English. So in fact, having that background of English really helped me to learn German a lot more quickly. So I wasn't going as a complete beginner, even though I'd never really studied German before. The other thing that I had in my pocket was I had already studied Swedish at university. So I already had access to a number of other words that other English speakers don't have access to. So, you know, things like wichtig, important, were very similar to the Swedish words that I knew. There were also a number of other words that I knew from Swedish that really helped to accelerate my study of German. And then I had time. So yes, I was there for three months, but how often and how long was I studying? I was studying every day for about eight hours. That's a lot of time to study a language. And also I was in the country speaking it to people, hearing it all the time. I was talking to people outside of my study. I was watching TV, which the TV option I had here is no longer there, but I had a nice picture of a TV and I don't know where it's gone, but it, the TV, I was watching that. I was talking to people and I was using German all the time. So I had no way of escaping it. This was before the internet. This was before um, you know, smartphones. So calling home and speaking English was actually a very expensive thing to do and not something I could do very often. So yes, three months, but if you were to study a language for eight hours a day, every day, and speak it all the time outside and only hear that language, is that really a true three months? Is that the same as somebody who's studying an hour, an hour a day or three hours a week or even two hours a day. It's actually quite far from it, isn't it? And so it's all well and good me saying, okay, I was in Germany for three months, which is true. But what I was doing when I was there was actually very, very intensive. It was like a full-time job. And plus my downtime was all in German. And then after I finished and before I made that video that I talked about in the beginning, I worked in German. And I worked mainly on the phone and on the computer, answering people's questions, technical questions about their computer systems and giving technical support, customer service support in German. And I did that for a number of years before I made the video that you saw of me speaking German. So when I contextualize all of this, actually what you see on the internet is a polished, nice version of what I've done over a number of years. So when I say to people, okay, yes, I did learn to speak and communicate in German in three months, we have to put that in context. And I think social media particularly, we like to put a nice spin on things. So what I always say in social media, you see the really, really good or the really, really tragic. And it's kind of the, the normal humdrum, the ordinary stuff we don't see as often. And I guess because Look, we don't turn on the TV or go to the cinema to watch something very mundane. We go there to be excited or to be scared or to be thrilled or to be engaged in some way. And so it is with social media when we represent ourselves. We're not going to say, oh, well, today I just had a piece of toast. <laughs> it's not quite as exciting, is it? So this is what happened with German. And then more recently, I did a similar thing with Estonian. So I looked at Estonian and I took it for one month with Speakly and I went through the whole thing and and then I got an interview to, on television. Now that all looks really cool but let's have a look through that as well and let's unpick what I actually did 
yes, I studied for a month. And the perception is I got to go on TV in Estonia. It wasn't perfect Estonian. So any Estonians out there who watched it, watched what I said, they will be able to pick apart the number of mistakes that I made in Estonian. I can I could do it straight after I, I did the interview. In fact, my greatest achievement with learning Estonian was that I set up the interview through Estonian. And I was actually much happier with that as my achievement than the interview itself. Although it was very exciting and very nice to be able to do. Setting up something showed me that I had reached a level where I was able to communicate using Estonian to achieve a goal. And I did exactly that. It was practical. My Estonian was a practical level, which was great. It's around about A2, uh, I would say. But let's dig into it. I mean, before I started learning Estonian, I had spent two months at the University of Helsinki, years before studying Finnish. I was at a point where I could communicate my basic ideas through Finnish. I had completed two and a half books of the Swarmin uh, Mir study, and I was using Finnish in a very practical way around town. I wasn't by any means fluent or, you know, I would definitely not describe myself as any even intermediate, but I was able to communicate and get around the city using Finnish. That background really helps when you're learning a language like Estonian that's related to it. So again, even though I spent a month studying Estonian to do this interview, the context helps you to see that actually to achieve that, there's a lot of stuff that went before it. And it's not just me picking up a book of Estonian and doing an hour a day. In fact, with Estonian, I also had German and German helps we learn Estonian because of the vocabulary. So I'd had all of that information from German. There's a lot of basic Estonian vocabulary and sometimes the verb forms feel similar to German. So you actually draw a lot of help from those kinds of other experiences that you have. And that's how it worked for me with Estonian. And the time involved. I wasn't studying Estonian for one, two or three hours a week or even an hour a day. I was studying Estonian for four hours a day for a month four hours a day, every day of the week for a month. And I was speaking to an Estonian on italki pretty much on a daily basis for the first couple of weeks. And I was practicing everything I said. So all of this going into a month study gives you more of a context as to what can be achieved. Now, the reality of studying and watching TV and doing all these things when you're learning a language is a huge, huge help, a huge help. The difference though, and now let's change it around a bit, when I was learning Korean, I was, I've been studying Korean a lot more slowly. Now, take on Korean, people have this idea that I'm gonna learn it really quickly and I'm gonna do really well with it along with other languages. And I get asked, well, surely you're going to learn it really quickly. Well, maybe, maybe not, who knows. But I've been taking it a lot more slowly. The reality with Korean is that it's been a way slower. I've not been doing as many hours a week. I've not been uh, watching lots of K-dramas. I've not been listening to lots of K-pop. I've not been hearing it around me. I've not been doing it every single day for a number of hours a day. And so as a result, progress is a lot slower, even though I can say I've been studying, uh, I started studying Korean over a year ago. I mean, it's a long time to be studying, right? A year. Why have I made so much progress? Well, it's a lot slower. And, you know, it's really important to say that a language like Korean is super different to the ones that I've been studying uh, previously different sound systems. Uh, there are different sounds, different writing system that I had to learn. Um, also, the grammar is quite different. I'd done some Japanese and I'd done some Chinese before, but it's still not enough to help me really get ahead with Korean. And so the progress was a lot slower. Even a language like Cornish, this is a beautiful place in Cornwall, um, I also, the reality for me with Cornish, which is related to Welsh, which is the language I do speak, has been quite different. In fact, 
I deliberately don't want to go quickly with it. I want to go slowly. And I do maybe four, five hours of Cornish a week of study. It takes time to get through that material, to internalize that material, to make it become natural and automatic when I speak, to get it right. And then to go over things that I would normally and usually forget. This isn't something that happens just like that. Even after a number of languages, it takes time to learn a new language. And people are often surprised when I say, you know, I've been doing Cornish for nearly two years now, year and well over a year and a half. And I'm preparing my second exam in Cornish. There are four exams you can do, and I'm preparing my second one. And it's around about an A2 level. So we're not talking a very fast pace because there's a lot of vocabulary to cover. There's a lot of things to learn to be able to communicate in, in an efficient way. And that just takes time. Um, and so whenever I tell people how long it takes me, similar thing with Irish, it takes months for me to get to a point where I want to, I feel comfortable talking, particularly if the language is quite different and new, and I'm not doing that many hours. So my thought is I don't worry about it. I, you know, worrying about how uh, it, it's going to go makes no sense to me. So I worry a lot less about um, what I'm doing. I worry, I focus on on the progress that I'm making and make sure it feels like it's going to stick. For me, that's the important thing, because if I rush through my studies, then I'm not going to get anywhere very quickly because I will also have that high level of you know, attrition or forget things. I can quite safely say the difference between my Estonian and my German is that with German, I have continually used German of very intensively since then for many, many years. With Estonian, that's not the correct case. So after the interview, I actually used it less and less. And so now I'm sort of finding that I'm having to go back over things again, because you need to compact and compound the language learning that you do. Because unfortunately with a language, you don't just progress and go to a new topic and move on. You have to bring the whole base of the language that you've learned with you on the journey. It never goes away. You can't suddenly forget how to conjugate, you know, a certain verb in the present tense or the past tense. You have to take all of that with you and continue to grow and learn and move through the levels. So the learning process isn't as simple as how long does it take? It's how long does it take plus how long does it take to re revise, retain, repeat, make the language become automatic. So worrying too much about how long it takes for me isn't the goal. It's caring about and taking time over how long it takes to get that practice and make sure that I get it in. There are many ways to learn a language. There are many ways to get this right. And so the idea of my way, for example, could be different to your way. It could be different to somebody else's way. And that's fine. Um, there's no one way to learn a language. And there's, there's one thing I've learned from years in this language learning community. There's enough space for us all to have our different methodologies, to have our different ways of learning. And that's all fine. It's all good. As long as we're happy with our journey and our way, and we feel that we're making progress that we can be confident that will serve us in the future, then that's all that counts. So learning to find your way, not worrying too much about how long it takes to get that way and get to the goal of speaking language isn't so important. Just getting, finding your own path is the, is the really important thing. My whole philosophy really is to do with a holistic view of language learning. And I run and have been running now for, um, for about, five months, four or five months, language learning therapy sessions where I talk to people who are learning languages and we, we work through problems and issues that they're going through. And sometimes it's not just to do with language learning, sometimes it's to do with, with other things that are going on in their lives. And we have to acknowledge what's going on. And 
what we can do differently and what will affect the learning process and how we can maybe make small changes or even big changes in goals, in the types of activities we, we can do or find interesting uh, or even are effective for us. And for each individual, I find that that is actually different each time. Not everything works for everyone. And finding bits that work for one person and work for another is actually really important because it doesn't matter how long we talk about it, the journey of learning a language. The important thing is that we do it in a way that works for us and works for our, our day and our life as it changes because our life changes on that journey too and so my way of doing things is to take into account all of these different things what you bring to the table when you learn a new language what other experience you have what you enjoy doing what you like doing not just when you're on top form but also when you're sad and depressed when you're hungry, when you're busy at work, when you're on holiday, when something happens that occupies your thoughts and your mind so that you can't concentrate in the same way. It could be something in the news. It could be um, something at home. It could be something with a relative or a friend. All of these things affect us. And so talking about how long it should take us to learn a language to me becomes less relevant. And what becomes more relevant is how long a journey do you, can you can you be happy with? Can you make peace with the fact that this journey may change on the way? Can you make peace with the fact that you may need to take a different road for a while to reach the goal that you have in mind? Could it be even that the goal changes? And for me, these questions become more important than how long does it take to learn a language? And that really is all I wanted to say about this today. You are very welcome to join me at speakingfluently.com where you'll find links to my social media pages, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon. And you can reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm very, very happy to take them. Uh, I enjoy my lives that I do every Sunday um, on YouTube and Instagram at 6 p.m. to answer language learning questions for exactly this reason, because I find that I get some really great questions from people and I enjoy the language learning therapy sessions that I run and, uh, and individual learning sessions that I run because I get to talk to people, maybe like you, who have very specific questions that are not always answered by the generic materials out there. And I'm very happy to answer questions now and to talk to you about uh, these things. Okay, let's see. I have a question here. How much money do you spend on average to study a language? A language okay books i talky depends on the language there's not really a a definite sort of amount that i spend i possibly would say that it depends on the language because obviously some languages are cheaper to study than others so paying for a teacher for norwegian and paying for a teacher for indonesian is going to be quite different on i talky for example so um there's not really an average. I do tend to do a lot of self-study and then I use teachers to help with practice or language partners. And so I don't spend a huge amount, but um, I do probably spend in a year, maybe maybe around about a thousand euro, maybe, maybe, depending on the year. What's your motivation to learn a new language? Say the last three examples. From the last languages um okay so one language that i'm studying right now is um is cornish and i'm studying cornish because um, a friend of mine maureen was interested in starting um a course and asked me if i'd like to join and i thought it would be very nice to do that and i 
it was online, it was COVID. Um, learning other Celtic languages was something I planned for my retirement, in fact. But because COVID happened, it made them accessible online. And so I signed up and as somebody who speaks Welsh, it is a sister language. And I was always interested in, in learning other Celtic languages anyway. And when I started, um, I actually found that I really enjoyed it. I got to make friends through it. And now I really enjoy the groups that I'm in and I like the people and that keeps me going to learn it. Other languages, Irish, for example, um, again, similar reason. I, I just done, just before the, the pandemic hit, I organized a, a language event in Edinburgh. And we talked about the languages of the Isles. And one of those languages of the Isles where I'm from is Irish and um, Irish and Gaelic. And I was interested and I did some Gaelic but then I was really, really interested in learning Irish. And so I decided that I would prioritize Irish. And um, I'm from a part of the UK where uh, it's very mixed. So the heritage and the original dialect and accent that I, I grew up speaking um, is actually the manifestation of a mix of Welsh and Irish. And, uh, and so it was, it was, it's always appealed to me. There's always felt like there's a connection for me. And, then I'm trying to think of another language that I've been studying recently that maybe would be interesting to comment on. Um, Korean, I, I, I did study some Korean and I kind of do. It's not as intensive for sure and it is very different. And that was because my daughter was interested in, in studying some Korean um, at the start of the pandemic. And so I started learning a bit with her and I made some friends who were studying it who really like K-pop and different things and K-dramas. And we meet on Clubhouse and we study some Korean together. And I, I really just enjoyed that. I enjoyed meeting up with them. So yeah, that's just kind of ticking along very, very slowly. Um, how many out of the 50 um, you studied, do you speak at C1, C2 level? Very difficult to pin that down because most of the languages I studied, we didn't have those levels available. We didn't. There wasn't, there was no exam for C1 or C2 level. Now, it's very difficult to go back and sort of reassess yourself. And so I, I don't know how far I can do that. Um, so to give you an example, the course that I did in Czech Republic at Charles University was a, an advanced diploma in Czech studies. And I, I did the, the sort of, as I say, the advanced course for that. And nowadays, I think that they say that that level is C1, I think. I'm not sure, but I think it's C1 they say it is. Do I feel like I'm C1 in Czech right now? I don't know, I don't, possibly not. I would say more like maybe if I were to go back to Czech Republic, it would be very, very quick for me to get back to say a sort of a B2-ish level, but um, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'd be C1. Uh, there are a number of languages I speak commonly and very often or have understanding of to a very high level. Um, but I don't know exactly how many of them. Um, the ones I studied at university potentially, um, which are French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and then German and Dutch and uh, Macedonian, they're languages that I'm very confident in. So maybe those ones are, um, are around that, but it's very difficult for me to say because I've never sat one of those exams either. I, I have done a B1 exam in Turkish. That's as, as much as I've done of those exams. Do you agree with the statement that if you decide to learn some language just because you want to speak more languages, it will not work because you have to have a real motivation for it? Um, potentially, I mean, some everyone's different. And this is the thing, right? So some people will, will have that goal of wanting to speak lots of languages. Depends what you want to speak and what you want to be able to say in the language. I mean, if you, if your goal is to just be able to get by in basic um, communication, then maybe that might be enough, especially if the language is similar to another language you speak, and then you can use it in a quite effortless way, uh, then and a natural way, then maybe it might work. Um, but I, I don't know, I think it's, it is quite difficult to not have anything to motivate you apart from that. Maybe that might be a starting point and then you get more motivation. I can see how that can happen for sure. Um, but it's very, it, it's very difficult to answer that um, and, and be uh, 
all encompassing of it. it. It definitely isn't something that I would necessarily do myself. Um, I have sure looked at languages that are similar to languages I speak just because I was out of just pure curiosity, how they work, how are they different? Are there any funny false friends that you can find? And, and so sometimes I have done that and it's turned into more, like I've, I've wanted to learn more of the language. So I can see how that would work for some people, yeah. Um, how long did it take you to learn Dutch? So when I went to live in the Netherlands, again, I, I already spoke German at that point. I spoke Swedish. I'd studied Icelandic and Danish. And, um, so, and I also spoke French, which helps as well when you learn German and Dutch. I didn't put that in the slideshow, but it does help because some quite complicated words in those languages have French origin. So I would say before I actually got there, I was living in a part of Germany where they spoke Plattdeutsch, low German or low Saxon. And so I heard that a lot. And that was quite similar sometimes to Dutch. So that helped me make a bit of a, a leap, uh, just having heard, had that exposure. And then I bought, because I lived near Fenlo in the Netherlands, and I used to write a cycle to Fenlo to watch films in English because everything in Germany was in German. So sometimes I like to watch a new film in English and um, and they subtitled it in, in the Netherlands. So I would read the subtitles and I bought a book to study Dutch. And then when I lived in Spain after Germany, um, I lived with a Dutch person and I read through the book and I practiced the dialogues with him every evening. And so I was just interested in learning Dutch because I'd been in that region. So when I landed in the Netherlands to work, for, I was on a two-year contract. Um, I actually could already communicate to a degree in Dutch. And it took me maybe six months from there where I didn't have to ask for words anymore to say pretty much all the stuff that I needed to say in Dutch. And then um, I would say after that six months, Probably took me less than that, but after six months, I wasn't asking for, for for words at all. And people weren't replying to me in English at that point either. They would only reply in Dutch. So roughly, but how long it took me depends which level, I guess, you, you're talking about. I could communicate my idea, my basic ideas when I arrived. And that was maybe three months in Spain talking to my, my Dutch housemate. Um, Recently, I've witnessed debates on the use of the term hyperpolyglot, with some arguing that such a distinction is unnecessary and causes division. What are your thoughts about it? Um, I'm not so into labels, really. Um, I know that they're useful for an, a number of people to um, to kind of order the world. So um, and so for that reason as well, I use them. And it helps to give a definition, I guess. Hyperpolyglot, I mean, when it was brought about, yeah, the idea of speaking, I think, was it nine languages or something like that? Six languages really, really well, and then nine, and then another few, maybe. I can't remember how it, how, how it was defined. Um, I don't use it in normal day to day conversation. It's a good buzzword to use to grab people's attention in the media, I think, um, because it makes it sound even even more um, rare than, than just polyglot, even though polyglot, the word in English, is actually quite a strange word still. Um, and it's not that well known outside the language learning community as the word polyglot still. We, we, we kind of fool ourselves because we're at the polyglot gathering and we talk about polyglotism and polyglots all the time. But actually, as a word for many millions of speakers of English, it's not a known concept in the same way. We'd like to think it is, I think, in our community, but I don't think it always is. Um, it's definitely a known term in French, uh, but not in English in the same way. Multilingual is more understandable to most English speaking people. Do I think it's necessary to make the distinction? I don't know. Personally, I, I, I don't. Really, as far as I'm concerned, the term polyglot to me has come to mean somebody who's very interested in learning languages that they don't need for their normal day-to-day -day life. 
and or you know their family or surroundings and they learn languages that they don't necessarily need and if you speak one language or your learning languages and you identify with the idea of just this love of learning another language or languages and you like the term polyglot because it helps you belong to that group of people then i say welcome to the club because we're glad to have you so yeah polyglot hyper polyglot yeah. as long as you like languages i think you're fantastic so <laughs> Actually, I like people who don't like languages too. I'm not gonna <laughs> just to, just to say I've got a number of friends and family members who don't necessarily like languages like I do. They're all still okay too. <laughs> but yeah. Um okay. If you if you were to give us just one piece of advice, what would it be? Wow. Uh, one piece of advice would be doing something every day is is the thing. Like even if it's just a little bit. Because the worst thing is when you stop and if you or if you do stop this is the thing if you do stop make sure you've agreed with yourself that you're going to stop let it be a conscious decision that you say i'm not going to study this week i'm not going to study the next two weeks and make it a conscious decision the worst thing you can do is to let it just slide and then feel guilty at the end of a week or two weeks or even a day of not studying and then you feel like you can't go back or it's very difficult to go back and then if you can't then when then when you do go back you can sort of revise what you've done and move forward but doing your studies regularly is really important um i know maybe, maybe people maybe say that but it is really important um just psychologically it's important and don't be afraid to take time over um a book like i had somebody once say to me you know they were gonna they were doing like a chapter a week of a book and the colloquial swedish book that we used we we did over a year at university it took us a year to go through the whole book just to kind of give an idea of of what kind of amount of of details in there we supplemented it with other things but it took a year whereas i think sometimes people will go through that in like a month or two and and then wonder why they're not retaining the information well it's very, very quick to go through that that, that fast. Um, unless you're kind of in Sweden speaking it the whole time or in the country speaking it the whole time. What is your consult consulting composed of for different companies and multilingual projects? Um, what about your recent project? What was your what what about was your oh what was my recent project about? Um so my, the consulting I do for companies is um, different to sort of language stuff in terms of like language learning. It's not to do with that. Um, so I, I get involved in recruitment and assessment of people's language skills to work on multilingual, multinational projects. So I, I work on that. I will also give advice on how the company might want to structure those teams or the work where some things may be combined or not. Um, also look at Q and A across languages. So see what the the quality is like across different languages within a project to be able to compare and contrast. Okay, are we are we taking into account the differences between the cultures and the languages and the countries where these languages are used? Um, so yeah, there there are a number of different ones that I I, I do for with exactly that idea in mind. And then this is done on social media usually. Um, sometimes on, on the websites too, but usually nowadays it's uh, social media led. And um, and so, yeah, it would be yeah, putting the teams together and then also making sure that the work was carried out and, and can be carried out uh, well. Um, so there we go. Do you agree that it's possible to learn a language in three months or is it more a marketing thing talking about this concept of three months? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I did learn German in a three-month period to the point that I went to Spain, sat an exam, passed it, and was then able to study German as my language. I was studying, um, sorry, I was, I was studying business as a Spanish student in Madrid, and so I was studying as Spanish being my first language, and then my second language was going to be German, and I had to pass an exam to prove that I could speak German to the level required to study business through German. Uh, but sorry, German through business, business through German. So yeah, I was, I was, and I was doing translations and things 
from German into Spanish and Spanish into German and sort of business type texts and, and things like that. And, and yes, I did it in three months, but as I say, it was a three month period, but look how intensive it, I was, how intensive they were studying it. Some people might be, you know, use those, those hours. And I think the, looking at hours is probably more relevant. But eight hours a day and then speaking it constantly all the time is very different to just three hours once a, once a day for an hour or you know, a few times a week. I think, yes, it can be possible, but yes, there is a nice ring to learn a language in three months. And you had a Hugo. Hugo had you know, Italian in three months. They, they had an entire series like that. So Benny, Benny's learning in three months, um, you know, language hacking and stuff. It was something I'd already seen by Hugo, which was a, a language company before, uh, before the internet. And, and so that was a thing. And so marketing wise, yeah, of course, people are going to want to choose a book saying, learn it in three months over, learn Greek in 25 years, which is another book, right? Written, um, which is, is pretty cool, I think is the title, but yeah. Who's, which one are you going to choose? It says Greek in three months or Greek in 25 years. Which one are people mostly going to buy? So yes, marketing-wise, it's a very good tool. Do you have tips on how to go from conversational fluency to near native proficiency? That's a very big and long question. Um, so generally speaking, it is taking yourself out of your comfort zone. And how you actually do that is by adding detail to what you say. So when you're at a conversational level, you can basically talk about most things. I mean, at an A2, B1 level, you can probably converse for quite a long time. And you can probably even stay at that level for a long time and make friends and go out and enjoy your life. And you'll pick up more words slowly but surely, and it might develop. But if your goal is to get really good quite quickly, you're going to have to start thinking about how to add detail to what you're saying. And that's that means Okay, instead of talking about going outside, I went outside and I looked at the sky and it was really beautifully, it was almost a turquoise blue and there were swallows flying past and there were wisps of clouds and the swallows were gathering materials to make their nests. And I saw them under the eaves of the houses in the meadows and you could see how they were putting their nets, nests together, ready to lay their eggs. And there's a very big difference between that and I went outside. And it was a really nice day. And adding that detail is something you have to do very deliberately in a language. And that's how you start getting to this more technical vocabulary. In fact, when you talk about native proficiency or native level, I would prefer to call it native level proficiency. Actually, what you'll find is and many people at that kind of level will just say very basic things. Most people will talk at kind of like a maybe max B2 level when they're talking. And, um, and they won't add that type of detail into their conversations. But if you want to get to that level, you need to at least be aware of it. And to be aware of it, you need to repeat it over and over again, whether that's through reading, listening, or speaking. But you're going to need to understand and internalize that type of vocabulary. And you can really do that by making really conscious steps of incorporating it into your language, whether it's written, whether it's spoken, whatever it is. How many languages do you speak fluently? <laughs> I'll let you decide that. It's very difficult to say. Fluently is um, in the eye of the beholder. I tend to just let people decide. If you, th if you think I speak your language and if you don't, look, it doesn't change reality, whatever I say or whatever you say. And so, I mean, I've, I've used for work, uh, so, around about 25 languages I've used for work, for different things. Um, and in spoken form, in a day, the maximum number of languages I've spoken for work is 14. Um, and I did that uh, in Edinburgh, an event, and I had to use a number of languages to talk to delegates. But how many I speak fluently right this minute, and what fluency means, uh, who knows, who knows. Um, I hope it's not too personal, but how long did it take you for your, for your environment to accept you do a polyglot, possibly at a young age, for your environment to accept? Oh, accept me as a polyglot. Um, they were actually, I was very lucky. Uh, people thought it was quite cool that I 
I studied lots of languages. People, my 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 friends at school were very were very kind and very nice to me. Um, they thought it was quite cool that you know I would speak languages. My friends, um, my my family as well. Um, people tend to find it quite quite cool. So I've been very lucky um, about that. In the Balkans, people are very positive about it, uh, particularly. So yeah, very very good. Do you have any tips on overcoming frustration when your language learning is severely impacted by factors that you cannot control, e.g. health reasons, financial constraints, lack of time, energy? Um, this, I think, is where it comes back to the holistic thing, being realistic. Because getting frustrated with something we cannot change, yes, the frustration might still be there on the level, but acknowledging why it's there and acknowledging what we can actually realistically do about it can help to ease the frustration. And this is where I think when I talk in groups as well with people, particularly, or work individually with people, this is where I find that quite a lot of really good stuff comes out and we make peace with certain things. And I think it's important to make peace with certain things. You know, I might desperately want to be an astronaut or a doctor. That's not gonna happen at this stage of my life. Um, I might even, you know, long for it, but we have to kind of make peace with our reality because if we don't, it's a very miserable existence and I don't think any of us really want that. Um, so yeah, I think finding that and talking through it is really important. This is why holistic is really important. Thanks for the nice sessions and honesty. Yo, ADHD, deswegen frag mich etwas ab. Siempre, oh my word, siempre tienes un 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 bien un buen foco en tu nuevo idioma de de veras también convivimos los tres idiomas de objetivo sí sí wow okay I don't know which language to to reply in uh, but thank you for making the effort to try and write in lots of languages I really appreciate it um, I'm I'm going to stick to English because I I don't know which language to uh, to do to to reply in here otherwise um, so my focus is it depends on the language so sometimes i have short-term projects where i i plan to learn a language to go to a place sometimes i just want to understand how the language works and get understand the the structures of the language get an idea of the basic um you know, vocabulary that kind of thing um other times it's because i want to get more into it and more involved and those things tend to take longer um, over a longer period of time uh, but yeah, the focus is always different. And I'm, I try to be very clear with myself what I want to do in the beginning and what I want to achieve. And I always find language exams help with that, like courses. That's why I like courses so much, because I find that I've got the courses already laid out for me, so I know where I'm going with the language. Um, so doing the Cornish exams for me is a lot of fun because I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. I know, I know the steps to get there. So yeah, that's that's kind of what I do. Um, let me see. Are your language learning sessions potentially open to people who are watching this talk? Absolutely they are. Feel free to get in touch via the speakingfluently.com website. And you're very, very welcome to to check out Patreon or to check out um, check out the, the the other channels. You can write reach out to me. You're very, very welcome. Absolutely. Um, what's your tip? Uh, with learning multiple languages at a time, specifically how do you decide to split up your focus to each language when you want to learn everything? Oh, wow. Yeah, um, this can be challenging. So when you learn more than one language, basically you're splitting your thinking capacity, not just your time, but your ability to think in different languages. So you're splitting a lot of things when you when you learn multiple languages. So it's it's challenging. It depends on the languages. Some languages are similar to ones you already speak potentially, others are more different. So I find that uh, depending on the combo, it, it really changes. Um, just saw your cooperation with Walter, okay, before this event. Do you think this entertaining way he is doing it is a good idea to promote language learning? Um, Val, so I, I've met Walter a few times. He's a nice guy. Um, he goes on the street, he makes people smile. Um, and if somebody watches a video like that and says, oh, just by speaking a few words of a language, 
to another person and trying to understand them and trying to speak up like how they speak if if that helps somebody come to learn languages then yeah i think it is fun uh, and good um i don't know how everyone reacts to that everybody seems to have very different reactions to this kind of thing um i'm tied i tend to be open if it's not something that appeals to you i would say don't watch it if but I, I i am aware that there are people out there who find out about the language community through people like walter and i think that's a positive thing so we all have different roles to play in the language learning community and i think there's room for us all you know just because one person does one thing and we don't all agree with each other or we don't all agree with the same methodologies or the way we learn or the way we exhibit what we learn uh, doesn't mean necessarily mean that they're all all bad or all good it, there can be a mix right and so i think that there's room for a mix i like a nice salad bowl in my life and um, i like to enjoy all the tastes flavors colors and everything of the salad bowl and the languages that we all share and enjoy is the dressing for the salad that's that's what unites us that dressing but we all have our individuality and we retain our individuality we retain who we are and that's what makes us all unique and beautiful in our own ways. Um, okay, so I think we've got to the time. There were lots of questions. Thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join me. And please feel free to join me um, on my lives on YouTube and Instagram, which are at 6 p.m. Central European time every Sunday. And I will look forward to talking to you all more very soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you.